Welcome, everybody. This is a humorous history podcast, and we're the Goofy Historians. Today, we're going to do something different. We're going to choose our favorite person in history and just take about five minutes and tell why we chose that person. So I guess I'll start. Um, my favorite person is, I thought about this a long time because here's the thing. Um, they always say that ultimate power corrupts ultimately. And um, in case after case, all through history, that's exactly has been the case. Um, and it's really hard to find somebody that had ultimate power that wasn't, that didn't turn out evil. A lot, a lot of times they were benevolent to begin with, but then things happen and the ultimate power gets to them and corrupts them and they become an evil tyrant. Okay, so what my goal was, was to find somebody that was the exception to that rule. And I think I found somebody, um, and it is Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was, the, was a Roman emperor. He was the emperor from 161 AD to 180. Um, he was the last, they say, of the five good emperors. Um, this was during the Pax Romana, um, which was, you know, 200 years of peace. But that didn't mean 200 years of peace with Rome's enemies on its borders. That just meant internally they didn't have rebellions and stuff. But the thing that he's known for is all of his great quotes. He was a Stoic. Um, and we can talk a little bit about Sto Stoicism. And he was a philosopher, and he has all these great quotes. And if you think about it, he um, really lived his life the best he could. Um, he kind of reminds me of Charles V in a way, but a lot more effective. I mean, Charles V woke up early every morning and worked hard every day and loved just one woman. And But Jesus, he made so many mistakes. Marcus Aurelius is like that, except he was efficient and he ran a government that was efficient. A huge empire rather than just one government. So I'll leave you with one of the quotes um, from Marcus Aurelius. I think is pretty good. It says, um, the happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts and and that is so true if you take a minute to think about that another great thing he did was he um, started uh, trade with Han China so that was cool too so we're going to have the rest of the team tell their uh, favorite person in history and then Haley will sum it all up and then maybe we can figure out who wins hi this is Joseph Whitmore one of the uh <laughs> goofy historians and I would just like to take a minute to uh, present what I think is one of the more interesting people in history at least one of my favorite people and like all historical people from the past you know what is what is mythology and what is truth you know maybe a little bit uh, vague around the edges but for this one we go back to ancient China. We did one on Lu Bang, which was the first emperor of the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty started in 200 BC, ends around 200 uh, AD in the year of our Lord. Um, and so the person I'm going to talk about comes at the end of the Han Dynasty, about 220 um, of the Common Era. The the Han Dynasty overlapped with the Roman Empire to, to, to a large extent. But unlike the Roman Empire, you get no Caligulas, you get no Neros, you get no crazy emperors, you know, or uh, a lot of the vision you get in the Roman Empires, in the Roman Empire. But it's, it actually turned out to be a pretty 200 years once you get past... Uh, year zero, you get into the second half of the Han in, Empire, but it does run its course and come to an end, uh, mainly because of boy emperors uh, not having the clout to run the empire uh, effectively, right? So it was taken over, run by eunuchs or, or uh, uh, palace intrigue generals, 
pretty great at generals who, who, who actually tried to hold the em empire together. But it, in fact, it fell apart and it didn't fall apart altogether. It fell into three, what they call kingdoms in Chinese, it was, it was the time of the three kingdoms. Um, and one of the kingdoms, the Northern part was ruled by a general called Cao Cao, I'm going to try to pronounce that correctly, uh, who was actually looking out for the child emperor. So if anyone, he was he was actually trying to keep the empire intact. I mean, he could have just taken it over. And in fact, his son did take it over. But Cao Cao never claimed to be emperor. But to the west, there's a uh, there's a, a, a kingdom that's set up called the Shu Han. And the Han is because it, it was part, or they saw themselves as a continuation of the Han Empire. Um, and the guy who set himself as a king was Liu Bei. And like Liu Bang was the beginning, Liu Bei is the end. Uh, he ends up losing, but he didn't go down without a fight. And what's interesting about this time of the Three Kingdoms is that it's really the most romantic time of, of uh, the Chinese history. It's where people, like the Han Empire is, the effects, the ripple effects of the Han Empire is still there, which is very cultured, very intellectual, um, you know, very literary. So these three people, Cao Cao, Lu Bei, uh, Guan Yu, Chang Fei, they're all very literate and they're all very intelligent. And the point for this point of the three kingdom is that you never, the point is not to win. The point is to win cleverly, right? The point is like Sun Tzu and the Art of War. The, the, it's, it's not to win battles, right? Sun Tzu, I think, said uh, something like uh, winning thousand battles is not the best of wisdom winning without fighting is the best of wisdom so that's what they do and what so Lu Bei, Guang Yu and Chang Fang are sort of like the three musketeers of this period they work together very cleverly to hold their little kingdom together and try to expand it and Lu Bei is the chief and he's pretty admirable on my list too and what he's he's a great emperor but more than a great or would be emperor is that not that he's a great engineer or philosopher or general himself but he knows how to hire good talent right so his two brothers who you know they bond as the three brothers sort of like the three musketeers uh they're all they all have their parts to play right and they all have backstories and there's a there's a novel written about it called the romance of the three kingdoms if you ever want to read it um it gets into all of those three characters. One Yu actually ends up becoming a god. If you see uh, little figurines in a Chinese store and the guy with the red face and a and, and, and a, like a large sword, that's Guan Fei. And you can still go to his temples in China. Um, but the person I want to talk about is n not one of the three musketeers, but someone they hired and someone Lu Bei really wanted on his side. And this guy is called Chu Gu Liang, Chu Gu Liang, right? And he was really, he's like a Taoist uh, philosopher, you know, living in, away from the city, uh, sort of minding his own business, but very super clever and very witty. He's like 10 steps ahead of anybody. If he played chess, he would have been a chess master. You can just see. Uh, so when like, Lu Bei, you know, comes up to find him, you know, he's, he's like sleeping in a hammock, but of course when they wake him up, they know he knows everything about what's going on in the empire and what, Lu, what road Lu Bei took and what Lu Bei saw uh, just from, so he's like a Sherlock Holmes, right? He can read clues, right? So first, I mean, it takes them three tries, but they finally get Chigaliang to join the Shu Han, the, the, the th one of the three kingdoms. Um, and, and he has a, a lot of exploits and they're always, there are never, he's never like, uh, charging into battle, like Alexander the Great or Caesar. He's always just outwitting everybody. Um, 
with nobody really getting hurt, but him, his side always coming out ahead. And I think maybe, and, and he, they, I think he still has books on strategy you can read, sort of like Sun Tzu, if you wanted to read, it's still like teach it in management school and stuff. Um, so you, I can, you, you can never say all of them, his stories, because they're, they're, all, they're all famous if you're in China. And if you, you know, any day in China, you could turn on the television and there's going to be something going on about the Three Kingdoms. It's sort of like United States and the Old West, the cowboys and Indian type thing. But this is, it's like if cowboys in, were actually literate, if cowboys were philosophers, and some of them were, but the, the emphasis on... The Three Kingdoms was at everybody's trying to outwit one another. So the famous one, I'll tell you, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, again, it's only one of many, so you can you can read about it and find out more clever things he did. Uh, and so once he's, Chugaliang with his troops are out on patrol, right? And he's at this little fort, right? And his men, one of his spies come up, because he has spies out there. That's why he knows what's always going on. There's spies all over the place. The spy comes and tells him, you know, we got to get out of here because the enemy forces are coming up. They're like a day away, but they're going to get here and they're going to come in force. And all we have is this little scouting platoon with a few hundred troops. Uh, and, and they're going to know we're here, right? Because they have spies too. It's like, we're just sitting ducks here. Let's get out of here. And Chug Galeon goes, eh, no, I don't think so. I don't feel like moving right now. We've been out all day. Let's take a break. And he goes, you know, they're going to be here in the morning. You know, we better get, we better do something. And all of his like generals and adjuncts and, you know, helpers are kind of convince him. He's like, nah, I don't feel like going out today. So what he does is, is he gets his second in command and he says, you know, what we're going to do, what I really want to do, I don't want to fight today. I don't want to run away. I just feel like I want to play chess, right? So let's go up on, so right above the wall, it's a wall, little walled fort. He goes to, there's this little pavilion above the gate, apparently, where you can sit and guard or look out at the scenery. He goes, I want to go play chess and let's go play chess up on above the gate. So the uh, second command goes, well, okay, because you're the boss, or right? what are we going to do? You know, uh, grab you, you know, and run away. So he goes up on the, on the wall, and he's playing chess. And he says, you know, let's open the market. It's like, open the gates, everybody, you know, go on, you know, trade. And just like a normal market day. Everybody's like, oh, coming and going. And he says, but just to be sure, put, a, you know, five guards out front and have him march up and, up and down the gate. From up inside, you know, outside the gate, so you know everybody can see that we're well guarded. And the guy goes, five guards isn't going to do anything. They're coming in force, right?" He goes, "No, nah, it will be fine. They, they'll, they'll see our guards and they'll leave." Right? So the guard, the, the the enemy troops do come, you know, and they're up on the hill. And and the spy talks to the enemy general. He says, "See, I told you, man. There, we can take these guys, right?" You know, they're not even prepared. We got like five guards out front and Chugaliang is playing chess up on the wall with his general with no sword within sight. And the general goes, yeah, you know, I know Chugaliang. I know what he's up to. Obviously he's setting a trap, right? He's got spies. He knows we're here, right? He absolutely knows we're here. And what he wants us to do is to think that we don't know we want him, <laughs> he wants us to think that he doesn't think that we know who he, what's going on. And so obviously it's a trap, you know, and Chigalian probably set, you know, some people up on the hill with like reflecting, you know, armor up in the hills. You can say, yeah, see, it looks like nobody's there, but there's, there's troops surrounding this castle. And once we go in there, swoop down, we're going to be in a valley and he's going to have all these troops around. He's going to come down and we're going to be annihilated. So the enemy forest goes, nah, we're out of here. And they all turned around and went home. And of course, Chugaliang finished his chess game, <laughs> packed up and waited for the rest of his troops to come. So that's just one. So appearing like uh, um, Sun Tzu said, when you're weak, appear strong. When you're knowledgeable, appear ignorant. 
and when you're strong appear weak. Did I just say that? So it, 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 it's about perception, what people perceive you to be, that's what, how they're gonna act and that's how to treat. And that's how he won the battle without ever looking up from his chessboard. And so that is my little uh, favorite person and read more about him. It's like the red clefts are uh, 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 straw men uh, borrowing arrows. Look it up, read, read, read the uh, three kingdoms. Okay, that's it, bye. One of my uh, history heroes is a man named John Staff, Colonel John Staff of the United States Air Force. Uh, you may not be familiar with his name, but chances are you've seen his photo uh, and very likely the work that he did um, affects your life on probably an almost daily basis. There's a reason I'm talking about Colonel Staff in my car, which is a hint, uh, and I'll get to that here in a second. But uh, anyway, what uh, Colonel Staff did when he was stationed in the Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base in southern New Mexico was um, nothing short of incredible. The Air Force was interested in studying uh, the effects of rapid acceleration and deacceleration on their jet pilots. And so what Colonel Stapp and his team did was create a rocket called the Solar Wind One that would travel on the ground. It never left the ground, but it would go at phenomenally high speeds and there would be somebody in that rocket and uh, the team could see what the effects of this rapid propulsion would be um, on a real person. And that real person ended up being Colonel Stapp himself. Uh, there were other people who could have done it. Um, he could have assigned it to another member of his team, but he chose to do it himself, uh, which is incredible because it wasn't known what the effects would be, including possibly uh, death, you know, rapid acceleration and deacceleration possibly could kill someone. So he took this task on himself. And on December 10th, 1954, um, he shot um, himself in this rocket across uh, a track of land. It never left the ground and reached an incredible 632 miles per hour. Let me make sure I've got that right. 632 miles per hour, which is faster. And it did that in five seconds. It reached that um, speed in five seconds, which is faster than a jet airplane goes. So if you've ever flown or if there's a plane flying overhead right now, um, he went faster on the ground than that um, plane is going overhead. Uh, and then he stopped in 1.4 seconds. So just try to imagine the, the feeling of that, that rapid acceleration and deacceleration. Um, so when he, he did survive, um, he was temporarily blinded by the blood in his eyes. Um, there were a number of other physical contusions to his body, as you could imagine, um, but he recovered from that. And uh, the Air Force learned a lot from that experiment and from others that this group did. Um, and the, the knowledge that was gained helped protect um, jet pilots, um, especially if they have to eject from their aircraft um, and be safe. Uh, Colonel Staff realized that there were broader implications for the knowledge that had been gained. And, uh, one of the areas where that was applicable was in car safety. Uh, so if you've ever done this, then you can thank in large part Colonel Stapp um, and his team um, who uh, really led the way, were, were a part of a group that really uh, pioneered highway safety and safety uh, measures in vehicles, including seat belts. Um, Colonel Stapp, for all of this, apparently had a great sense of humor. Um, he's, he's credited with um, coming up with a number of uh, fun sayings. Um, he, he possibly 
um, was part of creating the Murphy's Law. If anything can go, can go wrong, it will. Um, but there's some debate about that. And nonetheless, he helped popularize it. He did, though, create uh, his own saying, um, which he called Stapp's Law. And I'm quoting from John Stapp, the universal aptitude for ineptitude makes any human accomplishment an incredible miracle. Uh, and I think what Colonel Stapp and his team did um, absolutely is an incredible miracle. So thank you, Colonel Stapp and team, for what you did to keep us all safe as we're out traveling around. Hi guys, Haley Beckel here, and my favorite person in history is William Henry Harrison. I don't know if you know this, but William Henry Harrison was the ninth president of the United States, and he had the shortest presidency, U.S. presidency in history, and the longest inaugural speech in history. Another fun fact was that he was 68 years old when he was inaugurated, making him the oldest president at the time, later to be beaten by Ronald Reagan in the 80s. This is the 1800s. Harrison was even the son of one of our founding fathers and was grandfather to the future 23rd president of the United States. Pretty cool. I should also mention that he wasn't even American. He was of English descent and he was the last president to not be born as an American citizen. Harrison was of the Whig party and he was the first Whig president to be elected, one of two that both ended up dying in office. So let's talk about his presidency. His presidency only lasted 31 days. It was a month. He w went into office in March, 1841, and he died April 4th, 1841. It was so short that historians even forget to list him as one of the presidents of the United States. Harrison didn't even wanna be president. He wanted to be a doctor. He studied medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and then had to quit when he ran out of family funds. So he ended up joining the military instead. Harrison rose up the military ranks and became captain in 1797. He quit, or I should say he resigned a year later. During that time, he found himself a lady and they had 10 kids, 10. His wife, Anna, was often in poor health because of her multiple pregnancies, but she still managed to outlive him by 23 years. Then Harrison decides to become a politician. He joins Congress and even becomes the governor of Indiana Territory. After that, he goes back to the military briefly and goes to fight in the War of 1812. Then he decides it's time to return to politics. Harrison joined the House of Representatives to represent the first congressional district in Ohio. He tried to be governor of Ohio, but it didn't work. So he ended up being elected to the Ohio State Senate instead. Harrison didn't really make any money with his career choices. He only profited from his corn farm and whiskey distillery. In 1836, he runs for president against Democrat Martin Van Buren and loses. Four years later, he goes up against MVB and wins by a landslide. Now that he's president elect, he has to go to Washington to have his inauguration. And his wife is too sick to come with him, so he goes by himself. It was a particularly cold and wet day, but Harrison decides, I don't need a hat, I don't need an overcoat, I'm just gonna give this speech and tough it out, which was a bad idea. He then proceeded to deliver the longest presidential inaugural speech in history. It was 8,445 words and took him over two hours to read. And that's after his friend Daniel Webster, future Secretary of State, edited it for length. Harrison didn't really get to do much after that. A few weeks after his inauguration, he became super sick with cold-like symptoms. His doctor told him to rest, but Harrison said, no, I'm gonna go throw a party with my military friends. And the next day, it got even worse. And by morning, he had a high fever. He was diagnosed with pneumonia. Doctors tried to treat him with heated suction cups and bloodletting to try to draw out the disease, but it didn't work. Then they tried a whole slew of other treatments such as mustard plasters, Epicac, and castor oil. They all just made him weaker. Then nine days later, he died on April 4th, 1841. He was the first president to die in office. Well, we hope you enjoyed this video and got to learn a little bit more about our favorite people in history, such as Zhuge Liang, Colonel John Stopp, Marcus Aurelius, and my favorite person, William Henry Harrison. So we wanna hear in the comments who you would pick out of our favorite people in history. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and consider supporting the Patreon. We'll be back very soon. Bye.